Danielle. Welcome. Thanks so much. It's so been great, it's been great to be here. I appreciate it. Oh, I just I didn't even notice. I just, you know. Um, I was just thinking as all those women were standing up here, what would you have done with all, without all that goodness in your churches? What would you have done without those women? I don't know all the women on stage, but the handful that I do know are just beautiful and amazing and gifted and wonderful people, and I adore them, and I just can't imagine what would have happened if the church didn't have their gifts. I'm grateful for them. So every summer in New Mexico, the Pueblo Native American clans come together for their most important summer ritual. It's the corn harvest, the corn dance, and it's their responsibility to make sure that they do all they can to ensure a good harvest. And the dance that they do is a prayer for growth. Each clan has their own kiva or spiritual society, and each kiva makes elaborate preparations for this dance. And the kivas have dug deep holes in the ground because it is their practice to pray in the belly of the earth which, gosh, why don't we do that? Um, and so they dig these deep holes in the ground so that they make their prayers from the belly of the earth. And so when it comes time for the corn dance, some stay in this earth chapel all day long. They fast, they pray without ceasing from sunup to sundown. Others of them leave the kiva at an appointed time and they form two long lines of men and women and they're dressed in brilliant and elaborate traditional dress. And they stream to the center of the festivities where they will dance and chant and sing and pray hour after hour from dawn until sunset without ceasing. It's a vitally important function of the clans. It's their responsibility to ensure a good corn harvest and every person plays a vital role in this prayer of growth and supplication. Because everyone will benefit from the corn, it's the job of everyone to do their best to dance well in prayer for the harvest. The intricate headdresses and the complex foot movements and the subtle chant intonations are sacred and every detail is meant to be performed to perfection. And then, Later in the day, they send in the clowns. Just as the rhythm has become steady and resolute, just as the form of the dance and the chant and the private prayers in the belly of the earth have become constant and unbroken, just as everyone is feeling solid and good and deeply reverent, the clowns come. They step on the feet of the man leading the dance to disrupt his stomping. They poke fun at the dancers by standing uncomfortably close to their faces and doing weird things. They laugh, they tug at headdresses, they yelp and whoop in the middle of the chants in the times when it would never fit with the rhythm. Some of them run and grab babies out of the hands of mothers and run them around. They're called the koshari, and their bodies are painted black and white, and they have dried corn husks in their hair. Often they have rabbit skins on their body, reminding everyone that they bring the spirits of the dead with them. And these clowns are an utter nuisance. But theirs is the most sacred role of all. The purpose of the koshari is to disrupt the form. Just as the form of the dance is becoming stagnated, the Koshari arrive to break the solemnity, to bust up the aura of spiritual fervor, to obliterate any feeling of self-righteousness. Just as everyone begins to feel that the rhythm of the corn dance will never be broken, the Koshari arrive like hammers to ensure that it is. Why on earth is that considered holy? Why is this the most sacred act of the entire corn dance? Because the corn dance is a prayer for growth, and growth demands new forms. 
The Koshari don't settle for life as usual. They come wearing rabbit skins, as I said, to remind their brothers and sisters of death so that they may invoke them to new growth, or what we would call resurrection. And resurrection, as we know, is never life as usual. It's life that's new and unknown and still in the process of forming, right in the middle of everything we know. And as important as their role is, these clowns, it would be inaccurate to say that the Koshari are always enjoyed. They're not. They're a nuisance, but they are embraced because they remind the Pueblo clans that the world is not under their control, no matter how well they perform this corn dance. The world is unruly and mysterious and most importantly, always changing. And if they are to grow and survive, they must be people who learn to live and dance in the middle of disruption. Our Native American brothers and sisters know a thing or two about disruption, do they not? They also know about displacement and dismissal. And yet, these clans have survived in the midst of deeply oppressive forces for hundreds of years. They haven't died out, nor has the role of the clans, nor has this hallowed dance that has been performed for centuries. Their ritualized openness to change has allowed them to be people of renewal in the face of the most impossible circumstances. And as is often the case, they have been keepers of a deep wisdom that science is only now discovering. Because the truth is, now we know, change is actually the only constant. It's the only one we have. I don't know a lot about science, but I am interested. So I read books that I don't understand and glean like things from them that probably aren't exactly true. Here are a couple of those things. If you happen to have like a degree or something, I know I'm probably saying these things wrong. You can come and tell me more about it later. Um, physicists, as I understand it, are just now beginning to think that what they saw as constant actually may have just been because they didn't understand the world at its smallest level. It's like, oh yeah, we think nothing's going on, and then they got a microscope and they're like, oh, actually there's a lot going on. There's no constant down there that we thought. Um, even the speed of light I read earlier this year is not constant. What? That's like the one thing I got from science class. <laughs> Why isn't the speed of light constant? Well, I can't explain that to you. I was really confused. But apparently it has something about when you get down to the level of photons, stuff gets weird and it's not constant anymore. <laughs> and apparently, if I have not already freaked you out enough, time is also not constant. Are you even kidding? But every time I try to read an article about how or why time isn't constant, my head starts to hurt because it's like the multiverse and like, I don't know, too many things that I don't understand. So I'll just trust them that they know what they're talking about. Neuroscientists, as you know, can now prove that the brain and the body are in endless flux with one another. So, so much so that it's problematic to say that we have anything resembling a fixed self. Right? We can't figure out how to talk about consciousness or anything of substance, like, because there's no sense in which we are like this substance that's the same all the time. No, that's not how it works. We're composed of millions of choices and actions that we take every day, and we are equally affected by the millions of actions and choices that other people and other creatures and the ozone layer makes every day all around us. We are affected by all the millions of choices all the time. It is a dizzying dance of accommodation and disruption. This is what led sixth century Greek philosopher Heraclitus to say, you can't step twice in the same river. Once your foot's in it, it's not the same anymore. He was adamant about professing the, const the, um, about professing the constancy of change in the universe is something that wasn't true. He said, you can't identify the universe as static, which in his time wasn't the most popular thing to say. But the other thing that he said is that despite the fact that the universe seems lots more in motion than we often anticipate, he deeply believed in a unity of creation that was deeper and more profound than we could see. 
And he tried to figure out a way to say, okay, how can I describe this unity that is underneath all the movement and chaos and change that's happening? And he came up with a word, logos. Yes, that one. Despite all the change that happens and the logos, the logos, the word, all things are connected and one. The logos is the source of order in the universe, that by which all things come into being and all things come to pass. John the evangelist knew this. He had heard of this idea, which is why in his gospel he writes, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And as reverent as we are wont to make Jesus the Word, the Word of God often serves as a disruptor to our norms, the form breaker to our expectations, the one who calls us right in the middle of our self-righteousness. Jesus continually disrupts our uniformity, to bring us into fuller unity. It's always what he does. It's a little annoying, to be honest. <laughs> the most sacred role Jesus plays for us, this may be the most sacred role Jesus plays for us, his willingness to unsettle us just as we're getting comfortable. Because Jesus is not the statement or the doctrine or the book of discipline, he's the word. And as the word, he is both utterable and unutterable, both known and unknown. Jesus is both the holy dance and the sacred clown. And his deepest calling is to bring us into new life and resurrection. I arrived at college and seminary with a deep love for theology. I liked to think about the big ideas of God, and I was eager to pursue a unified theory of God. I thought that there was one. Nobody had told me there wasn't. Um, and so like Einstein, who thought he could come up with a unified theory of the universe, I thought, well, there's got to be one of those for God also. And though not Einstein, I can read a lot, so I'll try. Um, I came to seminary and thought, there's got to be this way to find a place for all those weird Old Testament passages and even for things like human suffering and death. Maybe like me, though, you found that theology's best answers still fall short of describing the world's deepest mysteries. Shoot. <laughs> For every systematic theology that has been written, even the most beautiful ones, there is a clown just waiting to disrupt the logic within it. <laughs> I heard Walter Brueggemann speak earlier at uh, Perkins this year. I imagine some of you were there. And I love that he said, yeah, there is a problem with the God with, that we have with the God of the Old Testament, and that is the God who inhabits the text of the Old Testament. That's the problem. As if to say, good luck getting around that, guys. It's constantly a disruptive act and process. Karl Barth, the German theologian, who may be on record as trying um, to write the longest attempt of systematic theology. Oh my gosh. My gosh. Get an editor, buddy. We have things to do. <laughs> Gracious. Oh. Well, Bart, uh, my seminary is obsessed with Bart, so boy, did I get to read like three-fourths of that. Thanks, guys. It's really helpful. Um, he saved his treatment for the Holy Spirit until the very end, which was a dumb thing to do, but that's another story for another time. As he was writing this section on the Holy Spirit, he came to the uncomfortable truth that, oh, the Holy Spirit is not particularly fond of being confined. And so all of these categories that he thought were going to just fit right in, he could just keep that thread going all the way through and add the Holy Spirit to it, it wasn't working. And as that realization set in, one of my professors said, Bart said, I'm going to have to go back to the beginning and start all over again which he didn't, of course. But even if he had, the ending would always be the same. The Spirit of God continually disrupts our forms. It's why Celtic Christians called the Holy Spirit the wild goose, because in their experience, the Spirit was unruly and prone to loud honking. <laughs> 
How lovely it would be for us to be asked to bear witness in a world of consistency and met expectations. That would be lovely. As it is, however, we are asked to bear witness in a world of both fear and wonder, in a world of both dance and disruption. And perhaps we bear witness best when we embrace the creative tension that seems to be ever present in the nature of the world and maybe just maybe because that's how God intended it. What would it look like if we didn't reject our clowns or shun them or even resent them, but bore witness to them as holy disturbances? What if we saw them as not disturbances at all, but as those who bear witness to the sacred that has been removed from our sight? Rudolf Balro said, when the forms of an old culture are dying, the new culture is created by a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. I read that in a book a couple of months ago, and I thought, oh, darn it, I'm going to have to sit with that one for a while because I hate it. <laughs> because really, who wants to be insecure? I think of insecurity as such a terribly negative thing. It's something to be avoided at all costs. I have two middle schoolers, so believe me, I've become all kinds of reacquainted with the apex of human insecurity that we call middle school, and it is not pretty. <laughs> it isn't. You know, everybody with middle schoolers know, or you just think, take three seconds to think of your middle school experience, you know, it's not good. Our uh, middle school principal always says, yeah, there's a reason why no one has a middle school reunion. <laughs> yeah. He's a wise man. He's a wise man. <laughs> He's like, this is the last time. Enjoy it. This is a one-time thing, kids. <laughs> you don't want to come back here. Uh, who wants to be insecure? I don't. But when I think about the power of this story that I heard about this dance, when I think about the power of those who dance knowing that the clowns are coming, the best term for them is bravery. They are not afraid to be disrupted. They're not afraid to be insecure. I don't think that's because they're planning to hold their noses and grit their teeth until the clown leaves them. Clowns leave them. They don't face the disruption with clenched fists like they're determined to stick to the rhythm no matter what happens and determined to get right back on ba beat no matter how many times they're interrupted. That's not bravery, that's stubbornness. Right? I think the beauty and bravery of this act that they do is their willingness to be open even while they're dancing for one of the most fervent things they believe in. What a contrast. I do Tai Chi sometimes, and the lovely thing about Tai Chi is that you realize that you have to hold this sort of softness and firmness of life. So you hold a really firm pose, like tight with your legs, and then your arms are just like flowing. And you experience in your body the contrast of those things, openness and firmness. Strong back and open heart, sometimes we say. This is what it is. These people who do this dance, they don't own the sacred, and they know that. The good news of that is they also don't bear the burden of carrying all of the sacred because they know that. They've come to know that their only job is to behold the sacred in wonder in whatever form that it takes. Peaceful dove or honking wild goose, Sermon on the Mount Jesus, or eating with the person that we like least Jesus, the gust of a mighty wind, or a still small voice. The question isn't only whether we can bear witness to the sacred. The bigger question is whether we can bear witness to the sacred in all its forms. I'm reminded in the Gospels that miracles nearly always are preceded by disruption. Just like that. <laughs> like, literally. planned that, but I totally didn't. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Um, if you think, no, you 
you're good. It's perfect. It's perfect. I'm going to buy you coffee later. Um, if we think of every miracle story that we know, it was preceded right before that by a disruption. Think about it. Friends of a lame man lowered him in front of Jesus from the roof, which had to have been quite a spectacle. The woman who suffered from bleeding kept reaching out for the hem of Jesus' cloak, even though we know that by law, really, she wasn't supposed to be out there mingling, much less reaching for him. What a disruption. Jesus only fed the 5,000 after the disciples became anxious because the crowd wouldn't leave, and it was lunchtime, and they didn't have anything to eat because they hadn't prepared for it. Total disruption. A demon-possessed man shrieked and fell down and yelled at Jesus before Jesus sent the legion of demons into a herd of pigs. The Sea of Galilee burst over the sides of the boat with brute force before Jesus rose to still them. A blind man in Jericho shouted out to Jesus for mercy, only to be shushed by the people leading the procession. But he just shouted again, even louder the second time, and Jesus stopped and healed his sight. After disruption comes new life. We know this. After disruption comes new life. Well, what's the biggest disruption that we know? Jesus dying on the cross. And what was the new life? Well, Easter. It's almost enough for us to say, send in the clowns. That seems to turn out well. It's almost enough. But old habits die hard, and it's so very hard for us to let go of our very deep fears of failure. And that's what it is. We're terrified of disruption because we think it might lead to failure, and it's not a risk we find worth taking. I know this dance. If you come over here, I'm going to mess it up, and then, like, what am I going to do then? We ministers and lay leaders, we people of the church, we are unapologetically earnest people. We spend so much of our days in the trenches of the human condition, binding up the brokenhearted, listening to the heartbroken, seeking to liberate the oppressed, attempting to bring spiritual meaning to an endlessly busy culture. Bless our hearts. We do not have time for clowns. We can't suffer setbacks. We are earnest people with an urgent mission in a world that is going mad. There is no time for clowning around. The clock is ticking. All of which is true. But the deep mystery is that when we enter into our job as Christ's witnesses with too much fervor and fists that are clenched in fear, we have lost our witness already. What will we add to the world when all that we can bring it is fear and anxiety and aggression? What are we going to add to the world doing that? What the world needs is people who trust the dance so much, who can hold their peace so well, no matter what's going on around them, that even the clowns are welcome. What the world needs are people who can take a deep breath and look at the world in wonder and not in fear. Margaret Wheatley wisely writes, the fear of error seems the peril, seems the darkest of Darwinian shadows. When errors hold so much peril, play disappears. Creativity ceases. Only fear and struggle persist. And paradoxically, we make even greater errors we say to one another, get it right the first time. How can we live with so much fear? We can't. The good news, though, is that our world is not a world of get it right or die. It's a world of infinite possibilities because it's changing all the time. There is no mythical window of opportunity that will be lost forever. There are definitely moments when things are moving more in our favor or the universe is aligning, and yeah, we should listen to that. But also we should remember that the universe is a far more forgiving place than we often give it credit. There's not a window of opportunity. Being a people of faith, we should know this. Scripture's filled with people who miss their window of opportunity. Uh, Abraham and Sarah missed it like a zillion times while waiting for Isaac. Like, 
literally a zillion, I counted one time. The Israelites in the wilderness made a ton of bad choices, some of them in rapid fire succession as if they had no memory at all. David was a terrible decision maker. He was totally incompetent in making good decisions. This is to say nothing of the entire band of disciples who quite often looked like the 12 stooges. <laughs> All of these people made mistakes. They had failures, they had disruptions, and all of them found more opportunities to get it right the next time. We don't have a window of opportunity. We have windows of opportunity. The world is always changing. If we missed it that moment, just get right back into it the next moment. Did you know that in the patterns of evolution, you can see that the universe is primed towards innovation? That's openness. That's flexibility. That's windows of opportunity. We have sometimes wrongly believed that the world runs on competition and survival of the fittest, but in actuality, the world runs on innovation and flexibility. The universe is constantly looking for unique and new possibilities. The 14 billion year old story of the universe says that life is supposed to happen. And it says that life happens even when we thought it would be rather impossible for life to happen. So we can't let the story of world as a machine or world as competitive battlefield become our primary story. Because life is about invention more than survival. It's about creation more than dominion or defense. When we're in survival mode, it demands results. It's impatient and anxious. When we focus on survival, we're usually leading with problem solving. And I mean a certain kind of problem solving, which is about making what you don't like go away. <laughs> problem solving. So if we took this and applied it to the clowns, we could easily solve the clown problem. We could just lock them up or send them away. We could decide just we don't need their role in the dance anymore. Nobody really likes it. Let's just get rid of it. Or we could be really crafty and say like, hey, let's keep the clowns, but let's just make them like fun. Can we just make them fun? Just make them fun. Problem solved. Unless we remember those words, those gut-wrenching words of Rudolf Barro. The new culture is created by a few who are not afraid to be insecure. Problem solving for survival isn't our only choice. Systems scientist Peter Singh says that we should move from problem solving in this way to creating. And creating involves not making something you don't want go away, but actively bringing something you care about into reality. It's a shift of perspective. You're not doing this, you're doing this. When we create, we don't ask what's wrong, we ask what's possible he says. He calls people who are these creators animateurs, which is a pretty cool word. It's fun to call yourself that. You put it on your card. Pastor, comma, animateur. <laughs> they, these kinds of creators are people who bring um, life into a new way of thinking. Thinking and seeing and interacting in ways that create energy and focus. They aren't special people, they aren't ordained people. We're all called to be creators and animateurs together. Animateurs are people who can come into any situation and find a way to bring new life, new forms into being while holding on to what matters most. Bearing witness means living a life of creativity and not problem solving. It means letting go of the form and allowing the disruption to bring about something new and perhaps unexpected. You guys did that 60 years ago, and you ordained women, and look at what you saw as a result. <laughs> Bearing witness means taking our calling seriously, but also taking the pressure off enough to live into our calling with joy and wonder. What we find when we take a moment to exhale and to realize there's not just a window of opportunity. We can laugh it off. We can take ourselves less seriously. What we find as a result of that is joy. 
In between fear and wonder lies the possibility of joy. Joy, which has room for the harsh realities of the world and the awe-inspiring wonder of the world. Joy has room for our reverence and our laughter, our delight and our pain. Last week, I went to hear Dacher Keltner speak. He's a psychology professor at UC Berkeley and the founder of the Greater Good Science Center. And his most recent work he's working on is exploring how awe, the experience of awe, creates deep positive change in us. To which I was like, yeah, I know, I'm a pastor. <laughs> Get on it, scientists, we knew that already. Um, but go do your little experiments and we'll be like, yeah, you got it. Um, but what he's found in just, just a few things that he's looked at is that experiencing awe makes us wonder and question everything. Well, sure it does. You stand in front of the ocean and you think, wow. And our response to things that are too vast to understand is awe. And it gives us perspective. It disrupts the form of the norm for us, and we are opened up to something bigger than ourselves. And it also gives us joy. People who experience awe, they're finding, are more connected to others and get along better with others. They become more generous, more compassionate, and less self-important, which is a pretty great movement towards discipleship, right? Sounds like good, good results. In one study he mentioned, they had students at UC Berkeley go outside for, in two groups. And in um, the first group, they had this, these students stand up for one minute and just stare at the trees. And then for the other group, they had them stand for one minute and stare at the science building, which is a bummer for them. <laughs> and then they had, I don't know how they come up with these studies too. It's like, who, like, are you high when you think of these studies? <laughs> anyway, they had someone come by, the two groups, and drop a box of pens. And do you know what happened? The group that had stared at the trees for one little baby minute were like way more interested in helping the person pick up the pens. What? One minute of staring at the trees and you're like just a better person already. <laughs> Which, go to the park later, I guess, is what we should say. Awe invokes wonder. It invokes wonder. When we're in awe, we can't put our experience into words. We can't categorize it. Our whole normal life becomes destabilized in the face of this awesome experience. And that can transform us in ways that stability never could. Stability may be comfortable, but I think it also may be overrated sometimes. We need a little stability, right? We gotta like get up every day. But too much, mmm, we can go on autopilot. We don't give thought to our actions because everything is gonna be just as it was. I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but sometimes I've gotten to the experience where I've realized that I drove all the way home from somewhere and I didn't make one conscious thought while in that process. I was like, um, am I in my driveway right now? Like, I got on the highway and I turned and I like dropped a kid off at their house. I wasn't, e I don't even know. I just, I'm at my driveway right now. I didn't think one time about it, which is a little terrifying, actually. <laughs> Stability can breed familiarity, and familiarity sometimes can breed inattention. Note the words on the knob, disengage. Stability can allow us that if we have too much of it. If we're stable, we don't have to ask questions or grapple with difficulties or confront challenges that are in every way impossible. We choose instead to live comfortably because we have the choice. Thank God for the clowns who force us to re-engage and put our hands mindfully back on the wheel so that we can ask ourselves, now, where are we going? And also, is that where we want to be going? Because that is when we bear witness to the most real and true thing happening in front of us. That's when we bear witness to the wonder of the world that God loves. Stability doesn't suit us. Fear definitely doesn't suit us. Wonder does. Will we choose to bear witness to the world in fear? Yeah, it's there. Or in wonder. I was talking to my daughter last night, actually, when I was tucking her in and she was having a difficulty with something. She was scared. 
And I said, well, honey, I guess you're just going to have to decide, like, is it worth it to you to overcome this fear or is it not? You're going to have to decide that. She was like, mom, um, I am afraid. Like, I don't get to make a choice about that. And I said, well, no, you're right. If you feel afraid in your body physiologically, you don't have a choice about that. But in two seconds, you do start having a choice. Feel the fear? Yeah, you don't have a choice about that. Two seconds later, you can be conscious and decide to do something about it. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, baby girl? You're going to live in fear and wonder. It's a tough question. I was glad I was the one asking it and not having to answer it for myself. (laughs) Parenting win. Yes. (laughs) How do we bear witness in a world of fear and wonder? We smile when they send in the clowns. We could do that. We could smile because we know that disruption is not a step back, but maybe a step forward. We smile because the clowns remind us to set down the burden of our earnestness and look with wonder at the mystery of the sacred instead. We smile because we're not afraid of being insecure We're not afraid of making mistakes, and maybe we're not even all that afraid of fear after those two seconds. We remember that Jesus said, don't be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me. And so maybe we will, even when we're surrounded by clowns. I was thinking about Psalm 23 the other day, and I was reminded yet again that, yeah, I had to give you that, that. You had to see that slide. <laughs> um, I was thinking about Psalm 23, and I was reminded again, which is helpful for me, that the love of God is not something I have to hunt down with laser-like intention. I can be a little bit much sometimes. I'm sure you hardly know me, but I'm sure you've already noticed that that's probably true. Um, I don't have to put finding the love of God on my to-do list. Because the psalm does not say, I don't know if you know, surely Danielle did everything right and God rewarded her. Or it doesn't say, surely Danielle knew where God was and what God was doing and followed one step behind in perfect synchronicity at all times. It says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and mercy follow us. What a wonder. As we leave this place, and as you are commissioned to do good work in this beautiful world of wonder, may you remember that goodness and mercy follow you. And may the assurance of that give you the courage to dance no matter what distractions may come your way. I'm a fan of blessings these days, and so if I may, I'd like to leave you with a blessing from Maureen Hilliard. May you be blessed with vision in these shadow times. May light invade the darkness. May it be a soft brilliance as bare as candlelight guiding you through twilight till dawn. And when the dawn breaks, may you find yourself upon a threshold. May you enter and go through. And may you emerge into the dance, a whole and holy new dance of grace. Amen.